on with us, trusting you to speak to your people as we continue to look at He will have passed by, but two, that the everlasting arm of God will open our understanding to see exactly what you expect of us at this time. Peridious times are indeed here, and we need wisdom, knowledge, to be the stability of our times. Grant us this as we speak your word. Come speak yourself, and let the hearts be open to receive you. Thank you for answers, as we have prayed, believing you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 He would have passed by, but two. My text remains Mark chapter 6, 45 to 51. And I will bring out some few things that I did not mention last week for emphasis. It's best to break it into two so that we can thoroughly look at everything that the Lord has given for this time. Amen. The Hallelujah Chorus is God identifying himself through the meanings of the alphabets of the Hebrews. Aleph to Zion is the same thing as Alpha Omega. Same thing. But we are all used to Alpha Omega. Alpha Omega. The Hebrews don't know Alpha Omega. They call it Aleph Zion. It means the same thing. It means the beginning and the ending. And in these two 22 alphabets, God attached different kinds of meanings about himself, different nature from 1 to 22. For example, 21 is El Shaddai. And El Shaddai, you look at John chapter 21, that was where the miracle of bread, miracle of fish came from. In matches 21, the El Shaddai, the aspect of God as El Shaddai, the breastful one whose resources can never be exhausted. They had struggled all night looking for fish. El Shaddai showed up and they could not even contain what they, what they, what, what they caught. The number 21 is El Shaddai, is Shaddai. Just to give you an example that he has tied his name, his nature, into the 22 alphabets. And we began to look at number six, which is Vav. And number six is the number of man, man. That's much everybody knows. But beyond the number of man, it has to do with the original man, not the fallen man. The original man that God created in the garden as a type of the perfect person that he wants to have a relationship with. That's the number Zin, uh, Vav. Man was created on the sixth day as a friend and companion and as a son to a God who didn't want to be alone again. That's the, that's the correct one. In second, in First Timothy chapter six, verse sixteen, it says, "God alone who dwelt in immortal, who alone had the mortality, who dwelt in light, inapproachable, alone, he was alone there." But the same God that was alone had the Father nature within him, and he wanted sons to be with him, to also rule with him. And that idea has not stopped. There's nothing the devil can do that can change it. God will still have a people unto himself. Revelation 14, 1 to 5 tells us that they will go with him with us to wherever he goeth. An idea that is started with Adam is going to take place one day when he will replace the angels, not fallen angels, real angels, with the redeemed of the Lord to be his assistants, to be his partners to rule the galaxies with him. If you have read scrolls 37, you will see the expanse of the galaxies where Neil postulated that God did not make them for form 
And I will show you today that the galaxies were not made there for fun. God has a plan for them. And in that galaxies that we see today, it tells a story. Story about reaching to him. If you've ever read a book called The Heavens Declare. The Heavens Declare by a guy called Banks. You will see in that book that even in the heavens, what people call zodiac, Egyptians turned it upside down. The devil is smart, we know that. He turned the story in the skies to what you call the zodiac. Originally, old documents, Akkadian documents, already that were what he used to write the books, the heavens declare. They tell the story of the birth of Jesus to the resurrection to the new creation, all in the so-called zodiac. They are there. If you get the original meanings for each name before they began to call this Scorpio, this Libra, this, go to the original names, the Akkadian names, written in the time of um, Abraham, you will see that they tell a complete story from redemption to the new creation. It's a very old book. If you can get it, maybe Amazon will give you. The heavens declare. Tells the story of the Lord. My point. He dwells in immortality alone. And then he made that man to be with him. And you find in Genesis chapter 3 verse 8. Genesis chapter 3 verse 8. Adam, Adam, where are you? The Bible says he came in the cool of the day. That's, sorry to say, King James and the people that wrote Bible is a wrong interpretation. And I can understand because the level of knowledge of the Hebrew words and the Greek words at that time cannot be compared to today. The word is ruash that was translated as the cool of the day. That word simply means the energy of God, the wind, the, the, the very being of God. That's the meaning of rush. What was translated as cool of the day. It's not time, but it means the energy of life. If you can get it in a, in a Hebrew dictionary, that's what you will see. You will not see cool of the day there. What you will see is the powerful one, the essence of God. Strong winds that blew. And, the vo- and, the, and there was a voice coming from it. That was God himself having an encounter, an intimacy moment between man and God. That was why the first thing he said in Luke 11, 1 and 2, teach us to pray as the Father, as um, John the Baptist taught his disciples to pray. He said, when you pray, say, our Father. Because the nature of a father is to have children and talk. And you find when he was leaving the church ages in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, he says, I'm now standing at the door knocking to the individual. If you open the door, we will come in and I will sup with you and you with me. Again, tells you about Ruash. Because when you talk of supper in those days, in Bible days, you are talking of a gathering of family discussing the father at the head of the table. And this one will come, this is my plan, these are my plans, these are my plans, and you will rub minds together. That's what Jesus was pointing attention to in that place. That I'm looking for a people who will go back with me to the Garden of Eden. That we can talk together. When you when he use the word sup, that's what he was referring to because supper in Bible days is always a gathering of the family eating together and discussing their plans, what happened today, what are you going to do about it, how to go about it tomorrow. That is the connection that is in that word, vav. Um, in that word, yes, vav. That's the word. In that word, vav. Number six. Number six is vav. It is written as a line that goes up and forms a hook to show you a connection, the access to the kindness of God or grace that we saw in the Numbers 3 
and 4 and 5. It is the ladder Jacob saw. The story of Jacob you will see in Genesis 28, verse 10 to 17. You want to take that for me? Genesis 28, 10 to 17. And, and Jake, let me give you a background so you, so you will understand because I had to cut it off. You know the story. He had defrauded his brother. And that's why I'm linking this to prayer and him. God was the one that said, the younger I love. But it didn't make sense. How can you love me and you let me come out second? It didn't make sense. Like you find my text. You told them to go to the other side. And you sent a wind to come and harass them. They could not. Why am I calling God when He was the one that put me in trouble? Trying to get you to understand why these people did not call God and they were depending on their wisdom and ruin, ruin, ruin with their strength. And He told them, What is wrong with you? Have you forgotten the miracle of the bread and the fish? We walk in partnership. You only gave me bread. All I did was to pray. And I gave you back and you multiplied it. Why couldn't you have called upon me in trouble? Why are you trying to help yourself? That's what I'm trying to develop to show you in this number six, the verb, the letter six, and the description of that letter six. The man felt he could run by himself. Like the disciples felt they could run by themselves to escape the trouble. He got himself the blessing and he saw the implication of it. He was going to be killed and he ran away. It was at this point that God began to speak to him. But my God, he speaks in symbols. He speaks in types. And the person that is going to slow down, slow down, will understand. And God was telling him in that place, in the story of the ladder, I can help. Why did you run ahead of me? It is my business to help. So pick it up from 10. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran and lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took off the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed and behold, a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it unto thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread ab abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south, and in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee. I will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it, and he was afraid. And I knew it not. And I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? This is not other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Amen. God showed up. The way you took the matter is not the way I would have taken it. Time and decisions, they belong to me. He saw a ladder going up and down. He said, This is the house of God. Yes. Once upon a time, the temple is still built on the same location. So the same location that Isaac was, um, Abraham tried to kill Isaac to fulfill an instruction. Same location. But today we are in the New Testament. We are two, three, I gathered in my name. I'm there. That place has been moved from one location to wherever you are. And Jesus confirmed it in John chapter 4. Oh, the, our father said we will meet, God will meet us here. He said, nope. This is the time when God is looking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Wherever he sees such people, 
God will be there. The ladder will be there. So let me now show you what that ladder is in relation to this number six. The Hebrew word for ladder, again, the presentation is wrong. It's not ladder. The Hebrew word is sulam. And that word actually means a staircase. Get it? Staircase. A ladder is a straight instrument that you hold your hand and climb and climb and climb. A staircase is different. The word there is a staircase that is a spiral staircase. Spiral staircase. Not a staircase that goes straight. It's a staircase that goes like this, like this, like this. That's the meaning of the word sulam. Let me show you pictures that God means business. This is Solomon's temple. This is Solomon's temple. And in Solomon's temple, you find a staircase there. Look at the design of the staircase. Mark it very well. In 1 Chronicles 28, I want you to read it. You can remove the scripture. Put the scripture there. Put the, you can remove the picture. We'll come back to it. Put the scripture there. 1 Chronicles 28, 11 to 12. Solomon built the temple according to the specification that God gave to his father. Quickly, please. Then David gave to Solomon, his son, the pattern of the porch and of the houses thereof and of the treasuries thereof and of the upper chambers thereof and of the inner palace thereof and of the place of the mercy seat and the pattern of all that he had by the spirit of the courts of the house of the Lord and of all the chambers round about of the treasuries of the house of God and of the treasuries of the dedicated things. I read that to show you that everything inside Solomon's temple was not his idea. It was the pattern. And if you read other scriptures, maybe like 1 Kings 6, 8, you will see the, David wrote everything down so that you will have what the builders called a plan. You will not say, oh, let me change this. I don't like the way this is. David not only told he wrote them down. This is how you do this, do this, do this, do this. So now go back to the pictures. This is the staircase that leads to the roof. Look at the design. Look at the design. Look at the way it was designed. Other, 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 other graphics, please. Other pictures. I just want to show you the design, the staircase. Look at the way the staircase is. Have you seen it? You remember it? Okay. Let's go on. Number next. No, no, no. Give me, give me, give me the DNA stuff. The DNA. The blue one. The DNA. We'll come back to this. The DNA. Yeah. Look at the DNA of a human being. This is in the, in the, in the blood of every human being. The DNA is spiral, spiral, and it comes from Adam, the father of everybody. His gene is inside everybody. God pointing attention to go back to him and see our relationship before he messed it up. This is my desire for the man I created on the sixth day. The man that carries the number six. This is my desire for him. And every human being is carrying it in his or her blood as evidence that this is what God wants. Now go back to the space pictures. Because God did not just stop putting it in man. He also put it for everybody to see in space. If you look at the, the telescope, the Hubble, the Hubble that they used to look into space, they see planets, galaxies, in this form of a staircase, of a ladder, going up like this. The galaxies are not arranged in a flat way, like this. This is how the galaxies are arranged, going up. Everything should point to God. Everything should go back to God. Human beings leave this dimension. 
focus on that top of the roof where um, Solomon's staircase ended. And that's the reason why in the Feast of Tabernacles, God told them, remove your roof. I want everybody for eight days in one year to look up to heaven. Just remove the cover of the roof. For eight days, put yourself in a small room, in a hut, disposable thing, and don't get attached to this world. No matter how big your house is, no matter how fine your house is, God made a demand on Israel that once a year for eight days, live luxury and just be yourself the way I made you. And just look up. No roof. Just begin to look up and see that this is where my life is supposed to end. Why am I still in this terrestrial form? Why am I living to please the world? Why am I dictating my affairs, everything I do, according to the patterns of the world? God for eight days says, look up. For your redemption is up there. Living and planning according to me. This is the galaxy that you're seeing. This is your Milky Way. If you look at the Milky Way where the Earth is located, this is how it is in space. It's like the DNA. It's like the staircase that is spiral. It goes up, up, up. That is it. This is how you see galaxies. If you're looking through the Hubble telescope, concentrated like that, this is how you see it. So, Psalm 19 verse 1, please. One and two. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. They speak, they are telling story as they are there, the heavens. They declare the glory of God. The firmament showed forth his handiwork. Every day, day unto day, they speak. Even in the night, they show knowledge. This is the knowledge they are showing. That everything should return to him. Everything should be pointing to him. And not this terrestrial region. And that's why he was bold to say in Romans chapter 1. That the nature, nature teaches you about God. That nobody has any excuse. Oh, I did not go to school. Oh, I did not go to university. So I don't know what Pastor Andy knows. Joke. Because you don't need to go to the university to see your surroundings, to see nature speaking to you about God. And that's not the only place. You also see it in Psalm number 50. As you read from 1 to 2, it speaks about the beauty of the Lord and the lessons that you need to pick up just looking at his glory. They speak, pointing attention to the Lord God Almighty who has made us and has shown us in diverse ways, this is what I want of you. But people want to bypass this pattern God has made. As they say amen every morning to one prophet or one pastor somewhere. I'm pointing attention to God is looking for individuals. Nobody has a right. Nobody has a right to pray for me every morning. If I have an issue, God has given me shepherds, right? Shepherds are here. If I need friends to join me, fine. But here is somebody that you open your phone. Amen, 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 amen. You are bypassing this setup in the number six that God has given. And I want you to be hooked up to me. Me and you. The person that is praying is praying a general prayer. He doesn't know what I'm going through. The hands are not the same. Whatever it is that I'm going through, my, my maturity level can take some. It cannot take some. It will take the God who put the gene of Adam inside me to know exactly what are the issues facing me today. And like I was telling somebody, 
I said, when you get to the level of this kind of relationship with God, you will have what you call little faith. Because when he accosted them, please read that scripture for me in my main text. When he accosted them, that's Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, verse 50. For they all saw him and were troubled, and immediately talked with them and said unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Courage. Okay, go to Matthew. In the same account, Matthew puts it 826. Note the word, be of good cheer. That means they were troubled. Don't be afraid. It means they were afraid. And there's no need for that. If you know your life is secured in Christ, why are you afraid? He and said he, to them. And he said unto them, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. If you look at the Greek meaning of O ye of little faith, what you will see is, Why do you have little confidence in me? Why is your trust so small? That's what you were saying, but I will come back to that. I will come back to that as I explain faith for you in a bigger dimension. But let me just follow step by step. I said, why do people want to bypass this pattern God has made? As they say amen every morning to one prophet or prayer warrior or pastor, whatever, wherever they are, somewhere, who pray on the mindset of people to keep them down. Mark my word, to keep them down. It is through life's experiences that we grow. It is through the sufferings and the stumblings and the falling down, getting up, that our faith develops. The God who could do this yesterday, he will do it today. Your faith rises. David said, I'm not going to depend on you. What am I doing with your armor? This is how I fought the lion. Just like this. This is how I'm going to fight this Goliath and I will kill him. I don't want your armor. I've not, he used the word, I've not tested them. I'm not used to it. I'm used to just prayer and letting God be my strength. I don't know how a 13 year old boy could kill a lion. I'll tell you a small story. There's this, this man, Jimmy Swaggart. You know Jimmy Swaggart. I watched his son. I was in the Republic of Benin one day, and I watched his son. He was the one ministering. And he was saying, settle everything with God before you take that step. My wife said, you work too hard. Let's go for safari. Let's go to South Africa for safari. What am I going to safari for? God has put animals where they are. What am I going to look at them? And I will pay my money. And if these animals vex now, I'm in trouble. He said, as if I was prophesying. We got there and the lion just roared near their car. He felt like jumping down and running away. Just hearing the roar. I asked myself, what am I doing here? What if this lion jump into our vehicle and people are taking pictures? My dear, my dear wife, you are on your own from today. If anything should happen to me, how will I face God? Did God send me to go and look at animal? God gave me Bible to preach. And you are saying, I've worked too hard. What's your business? <laughs> oh ye of little faith it is true life's experiences understanding who you are understanding what God wants to do now 
in my tomorrow, you can go back to yesterday. That's why it's a ladder. You can go back to yesterday to pick experiences that the God who killed a lion, 13 year old boy, the God who killed a bear, the smallest bear is taller than me, six feet, and roughly 88 kilograms. Ordinary beer is about 200. I'm not going to fight that. A 13 year old, I was telling myself when I was in the university, I was a fine boy, 70, 70 kilograms. I could jump free. And the tailor, way, the, the tailor came and said, Your waist is now 42. I felt like falling down. What the heck? How did it happen? I just said, thank you, sir. Just leave it at 40. I will walk my way down to 40. Started trimming down. Started eating less. On and on. But the point is, a young boy could not fight a bear by himself. It was the wisdom and the strength of God that did it. And he relied on that in the past. Those who were looking for human help could not get it in their leader because they had nothing to fall back on. And that's why their faith was little. That's why they were running up and down because of a Goliath. If they could go back memory lane, they would develop the faith that the God who gave Abraham the land of the giants in Genesis 23 Hebron was called Kajathaban in the beginning. Sarah died, said, give me the cave to bury Sarah. And they said, nope, we cannot sell anything to you. You are a man of God. We know you. And he said, I will pay. And they said, if you want to pay, we'll give you the whole land with all the economic trees. The man started inheriting from there. The Bible called the place Kajathaban in the beginning. It means a land belonging to four giants. And they begged him to take it. And God in Numbers 11 verse 22 said, you want to read that? Said, as the spies went out, God told them, go and look at Hebron and learn from Hebron. If you are looking for faith to fight giants, Go to Hebron and learn. Shall the flocks and the herds be slain for them? Nope, 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 nope. You're looking at Numbers. Numbers 13 was where they went out. Numbers 13, 22. That was where they went. The spies went out. And they ascended by the south and yeah. came unto Hebron, where Hahiman, Sheshia, and Talmia, the children of Anak, were. Now, Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Thank you. Zoan, human wisdom. Zoan had always been known as a place of medicine. Egypt, a place of intellectualism. That's Zoan. Anywhere you see it in the Bible, it has to do with the human intellect, human achievements. And he said, go to Hebron and learn. Hebron was built seven years seven number of God in perfection and what have you. And he says, go and learn there. Abraham got the land by being my friend. That's it. That's the meaning of Hebron. A covenant relationship. Today, the Arabs call the place El Kuli, which means the land of friendship. Till today, the Arabs still call the place, they don't call it Hebron. Israel call it Hebron. The Arabs call it El Kuli, the place of friendship between Abraham and God. So for how many thousands of years, God is still speaking to them whenever they see Hebron. That all things work in relationship with me. Me being your friend, you will get this free like that. They begged Adam, they begged Abraham to take Hebron. You will see the story in Genesis 23. He paid for a cave. They gave him the whole field with all the economic trees. Just like that. Nobody prayed in the morning for him. Nobody prayed for him. Just like that. 
That's what friendship with God will get you. You don't need to stress yourself. No. You don't need to stress yourself like that. The finger of the Lord is the provider. That's number 10. I will get to that later. <laughs> anyway, let me move on. I said people want to bypass this pattern that God and friendship has created. Contrary to Exodus 19 verse 6 and 2 Peter chapter 2, 9 to 11. In Exodus 19 verse 6, he said, I have made you a nation of priests. What do priests do? Priests go before God. And that's what people are afraid of. They would rather say amen rather than go and meet him face to face. Like Samson. He knew the conditions to come into his presence and refuse to pray because he knew he could not meet the conditions. Don't touch this. Don't do this. Don't do this. He knew he could not meet the conditions and quietly refused to pray. In that same Exodus 19, I want you to be a nation of priests. Individually come to me. Let's party. Let's talk. Go back to Adam and Eve when I used to come to visit with them and talk with them. In fact, if you look at Tagum, Tagum means retranslation of Bible. If you read the new interpretations of Genesis, you will discover that God was not coming and going. God was permanently there. He was there with them because he wanted to blend heaven and earth. And I also see that in Exodus chapter 25, 1 to 9. If you can just read 8 and 9. That was the message I was running with across West Africa. The history of the church back to Eden to understand why the church, why the church exists at all. We can trace it to Adam. <clears throat> oh, yeah. And let them make me a sanctuary. You want to read everything? Yeah, okay. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern mm. of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. The original intention of God has not changed. To live with you. <clears throat> In John 14, it says, Don't be afraid. Don't be sad. I will send the Holy Spirit, another comforter, who the world cannot see because they don't know him, but you know him because he dwell with you. Holy Ghost had not come that time. Holy Ghost came in Second uh, Acts chapter 2. But Jesus was telling them, Holy Ghost, dwell with you. So for those who keep saying, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, no difference. Jesus is everything. If you like, throw stone at me. Don't catch me. <laughs> Jesus, that's the one that is looking for your friendship in these times that we are living in. He said, build a sanctuary so that I can dwell with them. That was his original intention. You find Genesis, uh, Revelation chapter 21. Now, no more Satan at last. Oh, well, I will be their light. I will be their God. I will, build, I will be among them. We will all be together again. His original intention finally coming to pass in Revelation 21, 1 to 5. I will make a new world. This old world is passed away. I will recreate everything and it will just be you and I. That has always been his desire. Why do people deny him of this simple desire to have a people to himself? Perry Stone wrote Open Heavens, uh, Opening Heaven's Gates. And he said, among other things, that one reason why God allows us to lack is so that we can pray and then he answers and we are able to give him thanks. Relationship. Relationship. That for you to know that is there. So he allows people to lack 
he allowed them to roll. He allowed the storm to come upon an ordinary quiet place. They've never experienced it before. And then, so that they could call upon him. And he wanted to pass by because he thought that after all these years, you should know better. And that's the generation that you see today. Oh, don't condemn them. Go and look about their history. So I went on to search of the prayer warriors who disturb us every morning with God bless you. God do this, God do this. And I listen to different kinds of prayers. Individual things that you sort out with God. Somebody is praying it for you. How are you going to know God? How is your faith going to grow? How is your faith going to grow if you don't have negative experiences? Tough, but Jesus began to tell them, I did not just come to save you. I also came to scold you. You, why are you afraid? You are of little faith. Anyway, 2 Peter chapter 2, 9 to 11 says the same thing. That you are the temple of God. You are the stones that God is using to build his holy temple. You are a holy nation. A nation of priests. Why do you keep quiet if you are a nation of priests? Anyway, next week we will get into that proper. The, the profitable prayers is what I'm going to call it. If I, the profitable prayers. You will find that most of the things that we waste our time about on prayers, they are, they are just tiny, tiny things before the Lord. If you pray certain prayers, it is God's business based on the way you have prayed certain prayers to also give you certain things without stress. Because the scripture in Isaiah, if I may run ahead of myself, says if you close the needy, you take care of this, you take care of those who are hungry, then shall your light shine. And you will say, Lord, where are you? I will say, yeah, I am. He didn't say then you begin to pray. He said, then shall your own light shine. I will now shine upon you because you prayed certain prayers. I didn't hear as I searched through the internet to hear the prayers they were praying that we say amen to every morning. I saw they were personal prayers. The prayers that move the hand of God, I didn't hear it. And I'm saying, look at the word, look at the valve. You didn't show the pictures of valve in the beginning. That number six. You need to show it now, please. The very two clips, black and white. Yeah, that is valve. That's number six. It's a line like a ladder with a hook on top that hooks you to God. It is going up and getting hooked into God that God began to show in that number six. It's not just anything. It is getting hooked into me. And you do that as individuals. Not through anything. There is room for corporate prayers. I quite agree for that. And corporate prayers means corporate prayers. It is not, Lord, give me bread. Give me corned beef. Lord, my leg is paining me. Come and take care of it. There are normal things that happen to people. And God knows. He was the one that made a prayer. He said, as long as you don't live like the Egyptians, I will not allow the disease of the Egyptians to come to you. And even if they come, I am the Lord that he led thee. There are enough promises to hold him to. Let's move on. God answers prayers to everybody when they are in emergency situation. Samson prayed twice and both times were emergency situations. And God answered him in those two times. Saul, emergency situation. God declared, I'm done with you. Wherever you like, if it's hell, go, I don't care. I'm done with you. Please, please, God, please help me. Don't leave me alone. And God gave him another chance. So God answers prayers 
even if it's coming from the prayer co contractors. And that is not the standard. That's the point I'm making. It's not the standard. It is you sitting down in your corner, grabbing God and saying, Lord, how far? Where are we? Where are we going? Look at Ahab, wicked man, married to the most wicked person, Jezebel. And God sent the Elijah the prophet. He has killed Naboth. Now I'm going to deal with him. I will do this, do this, do this. And the man said, ah, please don't do it. I'm sorry. And God said, go back and tell him I've forgiven him. Can you see how sorry the man is? God told his prophet. Can you see how sorry the man is? Did the, same, did the promise not happen eventually? But at the moment when he was sorry, when he was in connection with God, God waved it. To the point that the person that is coming that does not even know how the matter started, God said the judgment shall happen to his son. When the man returned to his wickedness, the judgment happened to him, as God has said. So that God answers some prayers does not mean that is the standard. The standard is what I'm showing you in the scriptures. One-to-one -one connection with him. If you are overwhelmed, overwhelmed is the, is, is the standard, is the word. Call your brother, call your sister, join me to pray. God has designed, I don't know how people read Bible. God called himself chief shepherd. Chief shepherd. And other pastors as shepherds. Have you ever seen a shepherd that will leave his, his own uh, fl uh, what do you call them, flock and go to another person's flock to be saying this one has lies. This one's leg is bent. What can we do about it? Oh, we ask, what's your business? These are my four flocks. God has given everybody different shepherds. Different shepherds. I, was, I, was in, I started with Gospel Faith Ministry, then CAC, then House on the Rock. I got to Brethren, and God said, last bus stop. He may not say the same to somebody else. So automatically, my shepherd is a pastor in where he told me to stay. So what, what's the problem with people? That they will carry their wahala and go and meet another shepherd somewhere. If you don't have a relationship with that shepherd, you are in error. Neat. Because God has designed every shepherd to a flock. Oh, the scripture says he has given the body of Christ five offices. Correct. Where among the five offices do you see prayer warrior? Prophet, evangelist, apostles, apostles, that's it. Prophet, evangelist, teachers, pastors. Where do you see prayer warrior there? And if you read verse 13 and 14, you will see why God gave them. To bring the church to maturity, not to burn, not to burn babes all over the place. That if I, don't, if, if I don't lay hands on you, nothing will happen to you. I was on a plane one time and I saw a woman holding like this, a chain. And she was jittery all over the place. I don't like to mind my business, but that day I decided to mind my business. I would have asked, Madam, what's the problem? You're already inside the plane. So if you fall, finish. So all this fear, 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 what's the point? I kept quiet. When the plane landed, she cooled down. She removed her hand and I saw the picture of a pastor there. I don't want to mention his name. That one there. You know him there. That one there. She just held on to the picture of that man. Can this one save you? 
that is what these so-called prayer warriors are breathing. And the devil knows what he's doing. He doesn't want you to grow in faith. He doesn't want you to attack him by yourself. And that's what God is looking for. He said, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, has he ordained strength to shut up the mouth of the devil? He says, these are the children, arrows in the hands of God. They will shoot at the enemy at the gate. Who are you shooting at when all you do is amen, amen, amen? Who are you shooting at? You are designed to be the best soldier wherever you find yourself. And here we are, a generation of amen, amen, amen. You are cheating yourself of relationship with God. You are cheating yourself of the calling that God has given you as a child of God. <laughs> only sons, only sons, only children of God receive answers from God. Second Chronicles chapter 6, 14 to 18. I chip that one in to confirm that character is what drives people away from the presence of God. And said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in the heaven, nor in the earth, which keepest, co which keepest covenant, and showest mercy unto thy servants, that walk before thee with all thy heart. That's the problem. They can't fulfill that. So it's easier for someone to pray for me. He shows his covenant. He keeps covenant. And covenant is a two-way thing. You do your bit, I do my bit. For example, in John chapter 4, from 28 to 30 something, 32, he said the harvest field is ripe. Pray that God will send workers to the harvest field. Anyone who joins me in the harvest field will receive wages. God pays. And people are running up and down looking for things. When simple, going to the market, going to Yaba, going to Oshodi to preach, to minister to people, qualify you for wages. Answered prayers, wages. Because I've never seen anybody holding check and say, oh, God just paid me. If you know the person, tell me. God pays wages with answers to prayers. It keeps you whatever money you have. You don't run up and down wasting it on hospital bills. Apologies to doctors. You don't run around going to the police station to bail somebody. It's wages. You are in peace. If you have 20,000 naira, you enjoy like a millionaire. You are in peace. It's paying you wages. Second Chronicles 16.9. Second Chronicles 16.9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro the, the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. That's the word. Whose heart is perfect towards him? Only those ones is God willing to do something for. He said, hearing, have you done foolishly? From today, you will have wars in your life because he depended, if you read the full story, because he left God, stopped having confidence in God and depending on other kings to help him. As if God was on holiday. The God who gave you a kingdom, you will leave him and go and look for the king of Egypt before you fight. And that's why God said this scripture. Mark chapter 7, 27. But Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled, for it is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it onto the dogs. The word there is, it is not right. It's not meat. It's not right for me to take the children's food, bread, 
and cast it to dogs. If you look at the Greek word for these dogs, it is not filthy dogs like that. It was talking about Gentiles. They call Gentiles dogs. in a derogatory form because God doesn't abuse anybody. This is what they call you today but I see Gentiles differently. They are my pets. I'm still going to take them at a later time. But today is not your time. If you like, let your daughter die. From this scripture, it says I'm not interested in answering your prayers. You are not a child. I'm not sent to you. And that one began to worship began to pray and she moved from one time to another because God said, oh, great is your faith. You, are, you can receive what you are asking for. But he made it plain that only children of God deserve to pray. And it is because people are not focused in their hearts to serving diligently with all their hearts. That's why it's easier for them to pray and uh, to say amen to other people's prayers. But take it from me today, God is looking for you to develop a hook to him. When you hook, another word for valve in English language is peg. Peg. When you peg, when you hold peg something, you hold it. When something is hooked to something, it stays. It doesn't want people going and out, coming and going. I showed you last week the picture of the court or the, the tabernacle of God. Those in the outer court, they are there. They came to meet God. That's where they say, priest, 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 take. I sinned. Take, take, take. Kill animal for me so that God will not be angry with me. They were there. But that's just a salvation experience. Asking for forgiveness of sins. He wants you to walk beyond the outer court to the holy of holies. You saw many people were there. Only priests could get there. Only Levites could get there. And then into the Holy of Holies, right in his very presence. That is his desire. That you don't meet that standard is not his fault. That is his desire. And you need to just pray and walk towards that. Praise the Lord. Okay. So you find, I think I'm going to jump this. I've, I've mentioned it. There's two more things to glean from our text. One, it was the one that got them into trouble. He used the word straight away. Straight away means immediately. When they were just, just moving up and down without focus. Then he compelled them. Compel is to force somebody. The word, the word he used is he constrained them. He forced them to go into the sea that became boisterous along the way. He knew it was going, going to be like that. But he wanted to bring them to their knees so that he could show them what was missing in their lives. Okay? Straight away, he compelled them. He brings problems. He brings stumbling blocks. Ezekiel 3.30 we read last week shows he brings stumbling blocks. It's not demon that will bring it. God himself will bring it when the righteous is in error. So bring those that are needs to correct us. After showing mercy, then he will begin to scold us. Maybe like I'm scolding you today on his behalf. Not just here, those that are watching. He begins to scold them. To call somebody, what's the, what's the English word? A coward. Because when you say, why are you afraid? It means you are a coward. In some places, it's a derogatory word. If it's old France, the gentleman will say, on guard. You bring out his sword. You call me coward, on guard. They begin to fight to determine chivalry, manhood. This man called me a coward. I challenge you to a dwell. On guard. <laughs> and Jesus called them cowards. It's a big language so that they could reflect this is the right way this is the, this is the correct thing to have done unanswered prayers are his callings calling us to order we refuse to learn, we grumble see David's sick child for example 
had an affair with Bathsheba, killed the husband and the child. God struck the child. It was not any common disease. God struck the child. And the guy began to pray, to fast, to pray, to fast, to pray, to fast. And God still killed the child. To show him, you did something wrong. If I let this child live, then I'm not a righteous judge. I can judge others. Why can't I judge my friends? Psalm 119 verse 67. Thou art my portion, O Lord. I have said that I would keep thy words. One, one, okay. one, one, nine, seven. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now have I kept thy word. Before I was afflicted, God said, keep my word. Nope, this is what I want to do. And then God afflicted him. He went astray. And God afflicted him. That is his tire of scolding us, of calling us back to the right path. And instead of learning from trials, from problems, we begin to run up and down looking for a solution. Until you learn the lesson, many trials don't go. It's like a class. You go up, 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 up. You don't pass. You stay in one place. And that's where there are so many Babes, 20 years on the Lord, 30 years on the Lord. Because they never seem to pass from their trials, from their trial experiences. Jonah, my friend, go to this place for me. Go and speak to these people. I'm not going. Okay, I'm going. He went to Tashish. Nobody has been able to locate a Tashish. People have been postulating, oh, it's Carthage, oh, it's Alexandra, oh, it's this. But at least Bible scholars agree that it also means opposite direction, astray. Go here. He went here. His emotions ruled him, like our emotions rule most of us. Nineveh or Assyria was a threat to his country. If I pray for these people, if I minister to them, they will be saved. These people need punishment. That's why I said next week we will pray purposeful prayers. These people need punishment. Look at what they've done to Israel. They are coming to do the same to Judah. They've been doing it all over the place. They move people from their home country and throw them somewhere else. Any small thing, those who did history, Amurabi's laws, Amurabi was an Assyrian king. An eye for an eye came from Amurabi. On the streets, there were stakes, stakes like this. Oh, this man stole my meat. Is that so? Ole. Hmm. Bam, like that. Instant judgment. That was what was going on there. They would just carry the man, pull him inside, inside a, 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 a stake with sharp knife, sharp pointed points, and just carry him. The soldiers would just throw him down. Bam. And die there. Whether justice was done or not, that was Assyria. And then you want me to go and pray for Assyria. The guy went the other way. He said, I am God. If I love you, I will correct you. Fish, go and chop him. And the fish chopped the guy. I preached the message, it's in one of my books. The prophet who went to hell. Jonah went to hell with his own mouth. He said it. If you can place the, the Greek words in his discussion, if you read from a Greek Bible, you will see that the man went to hell. That's how strong God can punish somebody. Just don't get, <laughs> don't get on the wrong side of him. Moses said, just manage yourself. Apply your heart to wisdom. You don't know when God can get angry. You can tear that paper today and God will say, okay, it was a mistake. You can tear it another time and he will slap you for tearing it. Because by now you should know better. 
I wanted to preach a message called Crossing the Rubicon, and I'm afraid to preach it. But I can tell you the underlying factor in the message. You get to a point with God that he leaves you alone. You cross the Rubicon, you are on your own. And you find it in Proverbs chapter 1, among many scriptures. I told myself I will not preach the message without God's permission. Sorry, Lord. Don't be angry with me. <laughs> he said, I called you, I called you, I called you. I warn you, I warn you, I warn you. You didn't listen to me. When your trouble come, I will turn my back against you. Me too, I will be looking at you. I will laugh at you. Is that strong? That we should learn to do the right things if it lies within our power. But not throw it away and live carelessly and just follow the pattern of the world. Because God recognizes everybody's strength. That's why he said, according to the measure of grace given to you. What he punishes me for, he may not punish you for it. Because he would say, with your level of grace, you should know better. And then somebody else will do the same thing. And God will say, this one is still a child. That's why everybody just has to follow the pattern as he or she sees it. You don't see it, fine, hide under ignorance. Let me rush now. Jonah was thrown to hell and because of God's commission on his life and because God had decided that this man would be a pattern for Jesus, he brought him out of hell to come and give the message. And you will imagine that somebody who has gone through that will learn to show mercy and compassion. He was still saying, he was still angry with God. We are in this situation to have strong faith. You can go to the archives, you will see a message I preach, attitude of faith, but four sermons on attitude of faith. God's target is strong faith. He doesn't mind you growing from little faith. He doesn't mind. His own target is strong faith. The kind of faith that David had. That is God's desire for everyone that say, I'm a child of God. Let me tell you the meaning of faith. Faith is pistis. And pistis means, number one, Conviction of the truth of anything believed. There's a conviction. If I say, Daddy Modi, that barrel you are using is black color. Excuse me, I'm saying white. I'm convinced it is white. There's nothing I can say to convince him it is black. Because he's convinced it is white. That's faith. The conviction of anything that you believe. In the New Testament, of a conviction or belief respecting man's relationship to God and divine things. Faith goes beyond I believe, that everybody says it is. There is more to faith. It is respecting man's relationship to God and divine things. Generally, with the included idea of trust and holy favor, that started with faith in God. That is the meaning of faith. That's even one meaning of faith. It is a conviction that God exists, he is the creator and ruler of all things. He alone is the provider and bestower of eternal life through Christ, not through anybody. It's not a mistake when Jesus. When Paul said to, Paul, to Timothy, there's only one intercessor between man and God, the man Jesus. Human beings will draw from him as they are sent to the person. Number three, uh, number three point. It said it is belief with the predominant idea of trust or confidence, whether in God or Christ, springing from faith in him. Do you get that? That was what Jesus condemned in the people. 
He said, O oh, ye of little faith. That word means you people with little trust. You don't trust me. You only know me as your Lord and Savior, as the provider of miracle and bread. You don't know me that I love you. I want to help you. In fact, when Paul was, when Timothy, uh, Peter was writing, cast your cares upon him, for he careth for you. In 1 Peter chapter 5. The, word, the, Hebrew, the Greek word he cares for you means that he wants to be involved in everything that concerns you. What you are going to wear, what you are going to eat, that's the meaning of he cares for you. He wants to be involved in everything that concerns you. Which school should my daughter go to? Which school should my son go to? Should I buy this canvas for him? Should I not? Everything. That's the Greek meaning of he cares for you. He wants to be involved in everything. That's going to take interlocution. That's going to take talking to each other, getting hooked onto him. Climb that ladder to find out as you talk among yourselves. That's where we find ourselves today. Let me move on. The second thing that you glean from that passage you will have moved on is he uses nature to deal with humanity. Here it was a storm on an, on an otherwise cool sea. That place was never known to have tsunami. Uh, sorry. It was a typhoon. Bible the Bible translation used the word very strong and sudden wind. If it is 2021, the meteorologists will track it and say, storm is coming, prepare yourself. This one, it happens suddenly. And God has gone ahead to show you that all your tracking cannot work when he wants to be angry. It can't work. Recently, in Norway, this is this year in Norway, maybe one or two months ago. In Norway, a meteorite fell. No scientist, no radar tracked it. It just came whoosh like that and caused destruction. Some six years ago, with all their tracking, Russia, one morning, meteorite just came from nowhere, whoosh, destroyed buildings and everything and created a crater the size of two football fields and God was pointing attention to tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow when the stars will start to fall in the great tribulation in my studies I did nuclear proliferation one atomic bomb one dropping will create carnage 200 miles yeah 200 miles there, 200 miles here, 200 miles here. One. One meteorite coming carries the power of 10 megaton. 10. That is the world that is just ahead of us. One atomic bomb, the ones that are coming upon the face of the world. When the Bible says that it will destroy one third of the world in one day, in one minute, you can imagine the trouble coming upon this world. I'm moving towards the end of my ministrations, trying to show you that we are in the beginning of sorrows. And the same pattern of it will have passed by will happen to many foolish virgins. They would have known by the understanding of scriptures, messages, and what have you. So live right. Those who are the upright, those are the ones that is going to take away. God is bypassing they are radar. From nowhere, whoosh, it will come. Twice now, God has done it. Meteorites that radar did not detect. Falling upon the face of this world, Norway and Russia. In China, three days flood. Three days rain. Equal to one year rain. They said the rain that normally fall for one year happened in three days. I don't think I sent pictures to, to multimedia. I must have forgotten. People inside train, the water was as high as here. Like, thank God you saw them on CNN and Euronews. 
in Belgium and Germany, just from nowhere, the flood came, removed houses and what have you. And somebody in his wisdom said, it's global, what do they call it? Global warming, climate change. Oh, ye of little faith or little knowledge. If you go to history, there was an explorer called Eric the Red. That's his name. Maybe the man was red, I don't know, like this year. But that was his name, Eric the Red. He discovered Greenland just beside Norway there. He came from Norway, discovered Greenland, and it was so fine, so fine, that he named the place Greenland. You go to Greenland today, is mountains of ice. Mountains of ice. Mountains of ice. About, about three or four weeks ago, I was in Niger Republic, and I was smiling, taking pictures with dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. Engedi was a lush place, full of vegetation that they are just digging up the bones of dinosaurs from there. Today, it is desert. It's a tourist attraction. Bones of different kinds of dinosaurs, they are in Engedi and many places in Niger Republic. It is all desert now. When there was no industrial revolution, not one single industry, God tampered with the weather. For six solid months, there was no sun in Europe. That was when all this Antarctica and Greenland formed. The Bible says that God sent angels. I want you to read that scripture for me. Is in um, Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16, verse 21. And there, fell, and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail. For the plague thereof was exceeding great. The things that will be coming from the sky. God is the one sending them. And we are seeing them today. Read for me 1119. And the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Next verse. And there appeared a great wonder. No, 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 don't worry. I'm looking for a particular scripture. Okay, read Job 20, 38. Job 38, um, <clears throat> 22 and 23. Hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow, or hast thou seen the treasures of the hill, which have reserved against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war? God says, the hills, whatever is coming from up there, he has reserved for the day of I'm looking for angels and the sun. I'm, I don't know why I did not write it or remember the scripture. Anyway, the scripture I'm looking for, let me save time. God sent angels to the sun to put shovel there. Um, <laughs> put shovel there. And the sun intensified its power. And human beings are saying, oh, global warming, global warming. There are scriptures in Revelation that says that Water will flood all the coastal states. Huge, huge water. There will be flood. A star will fall and all the coastal states are going to, be, are going to disappear in one instant. Whether it's New York, California, whether it's Lagos. As if they know Bible. 
I read a report this week inside the newspaper that by 2050, Lagos Island will disappear. I said, if God allows time to get to that level, what's already going by the trend going on now, they are already, scientists are projecting that Lagos Island will disappear. Those of you who are buying land there, Lekia and what have you, said, you run away. <laughs> said, Lagos Island will disappear by 2050. The land will simply vanish underwater. What's beyond that? I'm trying to show you where we are in prophecy. We are at the point where beginning of the end, beginning of sorrows. Mark chapter 13 verse 8. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. These are the beginning of sorrows. We are just seeing, we are just seeing the beginning. I'm re going through all this to show you that God already showed you that luck will be here. Oregon, Oregon in the U.S., is among 13 states that are on fire due to so-called climate change. Dryness. They are blaming everybody. Turkey started just two days ago. They are blaming everybody. What I read in the scriptures that God sent angels to the sun. Ride it up. Put shovel there. God interferes. He uses weather like he used for them in that Mark chapter 6. So that our faith by now should know better to hang on to God. Do you know that Elijah that said there will be no rain for three and a half years, he got hungry himself. This is the time for us to begin to look for the ministry of ravens and to check our stomachs, what we desire too much. My sister was telling me recently, about something that she did, that they did, trying to tailor the appetite of women. That, hey, lean your pockets, lean your expenses. And people are saying, my mouth is too big for me to stop now. Well, you will be forced to. I saw on television. I did not read it. I saw, I had with my real two ears. A woman in Abuja, they were looking at a survey of food prices. Food prices in Nigeria, inflation rate is above 17%, rising from 11%. That's much. All over the world, people, when they are, they are getting to 5, 6, they, they cry. Nigeria is 17 point, 17 point something else. And a woman said, we have stopped cooking stew in our house. She said it live television. When she gets to my new husband will slap her. For putting him in public light. Say so we don't cook again because it's too expensive. All I do now is cook rice, cut some small, small pepper on it, put oil. If you like, don't eat. That is our own Nigeria. It's gotten to that point yet. I'm saying all this so that you will know how to pray. And stop waiting for somebody to pray for you. Because the circumstances around us. He's going to push people and should have pushed people to one-to-one to one with him now. In Jeremiah 45, I think I should stop now, 45, you, you see Baruch complaining. And God was saying, my friend, don't complain. You are the one who pronounced judgment upon the land. Baruch was Jeremiah's writer. Jeremiah will prophesy. He will write it down. And go and read it to everybody. And they will slap him. And go and slap his ogre. <laughs> and he was complaining. Because both he, both Jeremiah and Baruch, were from wealthy families. And you find them suffering based on what they have pronounced. I think that's why the so-called end timers are afraid to talk now, self. Because how can you say they will be famine? And you know it will touch you too. 
But that's where we have found ourselves. We are in the beginning of sorrow. Knowledge shall be the stability of your times. I'll tell you this story and I will close. It's a real life story. You will find it in Josephus. Matthew 24, in 15 to 20. Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem encompassed about with soldiers, then just run. Those of you that have property at home, leave it and run. When Titus Vespusians encircled Jerusalem, those who had Jesus said, ah, this is what Jesus told us. The priest, who should know better, also had what Jesus said. But they began to see open vision, open heaven. They began to see soldiers. Real life, you just look at the sky, you will see angels getting ready for war, shining their armor, shining their sword. And they jumped, God is coming to save us against the Romans. God is coming to save us. They started killing animals, sacrifice, sacrifice. The disciples who had carried their Bible and left and ran. God was showing them, I'm ready to protect those who are going to listen to prophecy and run with it. The Romans, with their swords, were looking at them. They left. They didn't touch them. When the last one left, they attacked those who were killing sacrifice and wiped them out. One historian said, they used the blood of the Israelites to make the roads of Jerusalem. That was how much blood was shed by the Romans in, 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 in Jerusalem that time. And the rest of the people, they threw them out of the world as slaves. Israel in diaspora till today. All because when Jesus spoke prophecy, they didn't listen. Those who listened, they escaped to preserve the Bible for us today. I've said enough. Let's get up and pray. If it was conference, I would say, oh, thank you for being a good, a good listener. Thank you, thank you. God bless you. <laughs> but this is sober times. I've said so much. And um, we can only look up unto God to help us. Evangelists. Come and help us through here. I need to leave here in the next 10 minutes. Max, next 15 minutes.